that you felt uh, the Lord was impressing on you, that you could be working through an area of your sanctification, not a one-off. Uh, if you got, uh, Mike, if you got angry with AB for the first time all year, that's not the issue I, I would want to encourage you to work through in this booklet. But if you were envious of his voice all year long, that would be a, a good one, right? Something like that. Something that, something long term. Uh, uh, something that you can track. You know what? I remember a couple of years ago wrestling with this, and I'm still wrestling with this. That's the kind of, of issue that uh, I was trying to encourage you guys to uh, identify and then apply to this, to this resource. So what I want you guys to do is work in your pairs and just... Have you guys already shared that in your pairs? You already shared one with one another, kind of what you felt the Lord identified? Because sometimes, sometimes it can be difficult to identify, and so when you have brothers uh, who know you well, you can say, hey, this is, this is what I, I was, I remember meeting, uh, oh, I'm meeting with a couple right now, actually, and, and um, when we started, uh, you know, I, I, I met with them, I think, twice, and then, and then ask them to do the same thing. And, it's, and I'm saying, based on what I'm hearing, I'm hearing this and for you, husband, and I'm hearing this for you, wife. Um, would, you guys, would you guys agree with those? Or, you know, and, and I said, prayerfully consider that. And they came back and they said, well, actually, uh, you know, one, uh, one of them I said, yeah, I think I agree with, with that. Um, and then the other one was like, well, actually, you know, I've, I was prayerfully considering uh, this issue in my life. And the husband was able to say, you know what, I, I would agree with that. So it's good to hear from your neighbor. Uh, you know, I, I, can, I can appreciate that. I, I think that would be a good issue for you to apply to this. So take a minute, just share with one another what the, the Lord impressed upon your heart, and, um, and then we'll, we'll get started, okay? I may ask a, a one or two of you to, to share that with the whole group if you feel confident in doing so. so. I have a feeling that if, if I let you go, you guys could... You guys could enjoy the day, <laughs> sharing life together, and that's wonderful. Um, so, um, can uh, would a couple of you guys be willing to kind of share the the uh, area in your sanctification that uh, you've you felt impressed upon by the Lord uh, to utilize for as we, as you work through this resource? Anybody? If not, I don't want you to feel pressure from me, but if, if you're willing, it'd be great. East Core? Uh, ah, desire for comfort. Okay, anybody else? And you're, I even, I even like the fact that you brought out, like, you tend to give yourself a pass on that, but with her, annoyance really, really uh, uh, is produced in those moments. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah. I would like, if you forget to do it, uh, okay. And then, no. ah, they went bad. That's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, bummer. <laughs> but with her, it's like, what? Inside. What? Right? Yeah. And, uh, okay, that's helpful. That's, that's good insight. Yeah, Emmanuel? I think that judgmentalism, and could we pair that with maybe self-righteousness? Mm. Yeah, I, I do that. Uh, I can easily be... Um, uh, Peg people, what we, how we, we say it, maybe like we peg someone, this is the way they are. This is the way they acted, therefore this is the way they are. This is who they are. And that is a level, that is judgmentalism, and I, I, can, I can act that way, I can respond that way in my heart, and I'm thankful that the cap was on. <laughs> um, but then I also know in my own heart that usually that is a reflection of a self-righteous attitude in my heart. Right? I am thinking myself more highly of that brother than I should. And I feel like I'm in a position to judge him. And whew, that's excellent insight. Now, these are the kind of things that will make a study like this really fruitful. You're, the people that you pastor, as you pastor them, the culture of transformation, uh, as, you, as you preach as you teach, as you instruct, as you share your own life, uh, you, will, you will develop for your church a culture of transformation and transformational change. 
uh, you'll, you'll use language like transformation, progressive sanctification, uh, all of these synonyms of one another to teach your people this is the normal Christian life. So who was it that had the, um, the example of, of the person who, who says, well, this is just who I am? Uh, Faisal, yeah. And that there's only one being in the entire universe who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And we're not him. <laughs> the rest of us are in a constant dynamic change, constantly changing. Praise God. Praise God is right, because uh, no longer being our own, bought with a price, now crucified and dead and buried with Christ, being raised together with him in life, uh, in resurrection life, uh, we are being conformed to his image all the way into to glorification. Okay? That's the kind of culture you want to develop in your churches, so that when they see their sin, what do we say? When you see sin, you should see what? You remember? Hope. Hope. That's what you want your people to experience. You don't want them to be afraid of seeing sin. You don't want them to be in a position of feeling like, oh, if I see sin, I don't want anybody else to see it. Certainly they're not struggling with the sin I'm struggling with. Therefore, again, back 1 Corinthians 10, 13, right? I'm isolated in my experience. I'm unlike these people. That's, that's not how we want the culture of our churches uh, to be. We want them not to be loose or easy about sin, but open so that the Lord can continue to transform us into his likeness. And he uses that humility of, of admitting uh, where we need to change to look more like Jesus to help us do that. He gives those who, who humble themselves grace. And we want our people to experience that grace. One of the ways that you're going to help your people fight for a culture of transformation is by sharing your own testimony. When, when God continues to change you, and you share how God continues to change you, and people say, whoa, that's the pastor talking like that. Now, if I remember correctly, that would be pretty extraordinary for this culture, am I right? Pastors generally aren't doing that. They've already arrived. So they certainly can't admit to struggling with sin, right? But as you, as you show them a better way, a way of, the way of humility, you're going you're gonna to help them see, oh, wait, if, if he can admit sin, and he's being changed by the Holy Spirit, I can admit sin, and I can anticipate the same experience. That's what you want your people to to know, okay? And that's what the gospel does. The gospel changes us. Now we don't have to hide in sin because we know there's no place to hide, right? There's no reason to hide. Christ has already taken everything that our sin deserved for us on our behalf. So, chapter one, we were just, we were just identifying the reality of change for the Christian life. That's what chapter one was about, okay? So, uh, God is the one who's changing us by the power of the Holy Spirit through the counsel of his word, but also through our relationship with Jesus and also through our relationships with one another. That's why I want you working through this in pairs. I want you, I want you so, so in a minute, you know, I'm going to have you start you know, talking with your, your partner, uh, the guy that you're paired up with, through some of this stuff again, so you'll have to switch seats probably, but... Um, um, I, identifying, okay, change is normative. Now, so, so uh, you guys are all familiar with Facebook, right? Yeah? I mean, Facebook, you don't see too many people in their, in their grungies. They've just gotten up out of bed. Bedhead, food in their teeth, those kind of pictures. That's not the kind of pictures people are posting, right? They're, picture, they're, they're posting the pictures of them on vacation, uh, at, on Christmas morning, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, in the, in, and, and everything's framed perfectly, right? The sun is setting just right, you know, they're, 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 it's the million dollar picture. That's the kind of image people are putting out, wanting people to see of them, oftentimes, not everybody, but most of the time, that's what's going on. 
if we're not careful, we can get sucked into that as a, as a church culture. And so, so I want you guys to know, in America, in, in just about every church I've been in, uh, either, either what's normative or what we are competing with is this idea that when we come in on a Sunday morning and I say, hey, bro, how are you? The normative response is, I'm fine. Good. Yeah, me too. Good to see you. You know, and on we go. And what the, the churches that, that have been more gospel-centered, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, listen, I'm glad things are fine, but seriously, how are you? What's going on? Not because we're anticipating, oh man, a big one's coming, <laughs> but just, just leaving space for you or for me to be able to say, man, I actually, I've been struggling this week. That shouldn't shock us, right? And, and it's not shocking because, guess what? <laughs> I was struggling a little bit this week, too. Uh, uh, I, was, I was a little down, or I, was, I had an area of sin that crept up into my life, and I had to compete with that, and I didn't compete so well, or, you know, whatever the case may be. That, that Sunday morning conversation is the kind of, of conversation that we can have with one another. And we're not leaving it at, at you know, the, the level of struggle so that we all kind of walk into singing, you know, depressed. <laughs> but that, hey, we get to look forward to being ministered to uh, by, the, by God's word together, by reflecting on the gospel together. And, and a- actually, maybe this coming week, maybe we can get together and talk a little bit more about what's going on. Um, Sunday mornings can, can be a challenging time to have an in-depth conversation Sometimes it's possible. Other times it may be the starter that, that we follow up on later in the week. But, but we're making opportunity for us to not just have this surfacey, everything's good kind of conversation, right? So um, change is normative. That's what you really want to take away from chapter one. Change is normative, okay? And he's going to use the relationships within the body of Christ to help produce it, okay? Secondly, we looked at heat. Is heat normative? Heat is normative. Heat or even dew, right? We mentioned a, uh, uh, an aspect of the diagram that they didn't build into this, but that others do. This idea, what's that? A blessing or a good thing. That's right, that's right. Either way, right? My sinful heart can move away from God <laughs> with either. And so, so, the, the, so suffering and, or trial or temptation is represented uh, in, by the, the sun. And so that's what we got into in chapter 2. Repent. Identify, recognize this, and, and, and recognize the, the kind of the opposite, uh, biblically speaking, the, 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 the old man or the flesh response versus the new man response. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, like maybe a simpler process. <laughs> well, it might, seems simpler. But does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. But again, Paul's always really good, too, of rooting whatever, whatever change we're thinking about in light of who we are. And so that's one of the things you really want to make sure and identify with your counselees is they're not just saying, yeah, I see the problem now. Sometimes they'll come in and they won't even see the problem, Right? If we're, if we're in conflict and we just cannot seem to be around each other without being in conflict, we can come in and speak to you and say, uh, James, we need your help. But he won't stop. If he'd just shut up, we'd be fine. And he'll say, you know, James, I was thinking the same thing about him. Get him to shut up and we're good. They're not even recognizing where this issue is originating, right? So first you're, you're calling them to a place, okay, well, let's just... Let's just first of all acknowledge uh, there's a problem. Yeah, okay, we get that. Okay, there's conflict. Now let's root the hope that we have for any change whatsoever in who we are in Christ. Are we remembering who we are in Christ? Good, okay. Let's talk about that. Let's delight in the Lord together for a moment. Can we do that? Yeah, we're a little ticked off at each other, but sure, we love Jesus more, you know? Um, Okay, or a husband and wife. You know, these things... These things have been uh, uh, going on for years. You know, the, the relationship has deteriorated so far for so long. It's like taking a massive cruise ship 
and anticipates, anticipating it turns on a dime. Do cruise ships turn, turn on dimes? No. It takes them a while. Or a battleship or you know, a, a, some, a massive ship. They turn slowly, right? Okay? So, so we, we want to make sure that we're anticipating change incrementally, but we have no, no idea how long this issue's been going on. And so we're, we're, we're having to start back at, at reflecting on the gospel, reflecting on our, our identity in Christ, and then making connections to, okay, this is how we have been responding. We recognize that's the sinful response, okay. And we recognize because of who we are in Christ, we have the ability to respond differently. Now, we also have a new desire that we didn't have before to please the Lord, <laughs> to be well-pleasing to Him. And so what would it look like to do that? Okay, this is what that would look like. So, I don't know if I'm answering your question just yet, but, but it's a process of gazing at the cross, glancing at our sin. Okay, make sure you keep that ratio in proportion. We're gazing at the cross. We're gazing at who Jesus is. We're gazing at what he's done. We're gazing at who we are in him, who he's made us uh, as new creatures, new creations in Christ. And then, okay, based on that, based on who he is, based on who he's called us to be, this is, this is an aspect of, of change that we can make in our life. Do you agree with that? Do you see that? Okay, and then, and then okay, you're struggling with making that, train, or you're recognizing you've been dealing with this, this sinful response for a while. This has come out in your, so there's a, there's a situation I know at a church, and a lady has, over a course of time started struggling with several relationships in the church. And then as you, as you talk to her, she's had certain family members in the city that uh, all of a sudden you realize, oh, wait a minute, those relationships are, have soured as well. What's going on? This, this person uh, who... I would have said was very healthy relationally is, is starting to have this common characteristic uh, in the relationships that she has with people close to her where now uh, she, is, um, she is resistant to them, she is embittered toward them, and it's, it's, it's a consistent theme in all these relationships, right? Okay, that's not just a, hey, you need to repent of that, although that's true, right? That, that is true, but wow, are you noticing how you have this intractable nature to all of these relationships? Where's that stemming from? Let's talk about that. Because if she doesn't, if she never drills down to that root level, it doesn't matter where she moves, it doesn't matter where she goes, it doesn't matter who she relates to, in all likelihood, she's going to have that same kind of experience this year and next year and five years from now and ten years from now, and none of that brings glory to Jesus. <laughs> none of that highlights what he's done in her life. None of that brings glory to him. So, I don't know, can you expound on your question now based on what I've said, or was I way off? Or No, that was a great answer. Uh, I know. And I would say... How do we know when to do one or the other? And I would say, be careful. <laughs> Bless you. Be careful to doing, be careful of doing either or. Do both and. So remember, this person is living out what Paul Tripp calls, uh, Paul Tripp calls gospel amnesia. They've forgotten who they are. And so oftentimes, what we're doing is we're reminding people of who they really are. And that's kind of what Josh was saying in Ephesians 4, that's what he sees. Paul's like, or Paul's saying, you don't, you don't even have this old man anymore. Like, he's, he's been, he's been uh, put down. <laughs> you are a new creature. You are uh, putting on now uh, expressions of the, the new self, right? Because this is already done. Uh, so, so, so you're reminding people oftentimes of who they are in Christ. You're reminding them of expressions of the gospel, and then you're turning that page. Therefore, based on that reality, 
let's talk about this a little bit. How does that apply? So you're trying to help people make application to that, but you're having to do it every session. And it's not a, well, this session, I'm really going to highlight the gospel. And then this session, I'm going to highlight the imperative nature of, of, what it, of that connection and what, what action needs to take place. Every session, you're trying to do this dance of, of remember who you are in light of who you are. How does that apply to uh, how you're acting and, what you need to be, and how you need to be acting and what, and what needs to change? And it's what you'll know, uh, you might know uh, and get a sense like when a person isn't experiencing the hope that you're, you're, encourage, you're, you're seeking to encourage them with, you may be spending too much time on the imperative aspects of what they need to be doing. And so you just want to get a corrective there and make sure you're spending time reminding them of who they already are in Christ and reminding them of, uh, that they're the beloved son, reminding them of their adoption, reminding them of their justification, reminding them of their forgiveness, reminding them of the, the imputed righteousness of Christ, all these things to help reinforce, okay, it's like that fresh air, right? <laughs> so when I, so as you were talking, like I got a sense of like uh, like free divers. Have you ever have you ever heard of the like the guys that'll go under and they'll be like under for, goodness, I think some of them are under for like an hour. Uh, they'll be under for thirty minutes, forty five minutes, an hour, sometimes more. Um, I don't know how they do it. I have no idea how they do it, but they'll go under for a long time. Um, Obviously, we can't do that. And guess what? Our counselees are not going to be free divers, right? They're not going to be used to going underwater. So, you know, for as counselors, as we're living this stuff, we might feel like, hey, I can go under and we can go deeper and deeper and deeper in this and, and be just fine. And then, okay, now we need to come up for air, right? Well, if we try to take our counselees under, you know, for any level of period of time, they might drown on us, right? So, so it's, that, it's that above surface fresh air of the indicative nature of the gospel, just reminding them who they are, delighting in Christ, enjoying that fresh air, but then, okay, let's, let's go under the surface here a little bit, and let's, let's assess what's going on, and we're just going to, we're just going to dip under there a little bit, okay, we're, and, and that, that ratio of, of gazing at the cross and glancing at your sin really is an important ratio to keep in mind. You don't want your, your counselees to think we're just sin hunters. <laughs> um, and I, we really are spending a lot of time in this part of our conversation on the aspects of, of uh, obedience and, and, and living out expressions of our, our identity in Christ in terms of uh, identifying sin and, and walking in obedience in those things versus aspects of suffering. Um, but it does apply there as well. Does that help? Yes. Good, good. Thoughts? Yes, yes, and it may not be, you know, 15 minutes versus 15 minutes or uh, in an hour, 45 minutes of gazing and 15 minutes of glancing, but it's in, in, in recognizing with the, with the counselee, where is their perspective? Are they, are they so focused on the issue and the challenges that they're facing that they've lost sight of the cross? Or as you're, as you're meeting with them, they're getting a, a bigger picture of who Christ is and what he's done for them. And, and their, their perspective is changing so that they're experiencing the hope of that. Okay, so now we can spend a little bit more time and a little bit more time dealing with this because they're not going to become morbidly introspective over that. So, yeah, it, it really, and, it, you know, in, in any given week, you know, a person can come in and they're just like, whew, their, their countenance has fallen, right? They were doing great last week. We were really able to get some good work done, but this week their countenance has fallen. They're feeling crushed under this load. Okay, let's talk about the, the, the gospel. Let's, what have you been meditating on? Sometimes you'll find out, well, I haven't been meditating on the gospel. Okay, yeah, we can't, we can't just do that one hour a week in this session, right? That becomes our lifestyle of walking with the Lord. Yeah. But I think because we're, I think we're, because we're life on life, we're not a, uh, uh, a model, a, a professional model. Uh, you know, we're not the, uh, the uh, professional counselor that, that um, 
keeps distance, a professional distance from the counselee. We are brothers in Christ or, you know, uh, I think there is a space where you could say, you know, we're going to, we're going to prioritize for the hour ish time that we spend counseling. We're going to, we're going to prioritize doing that here in the office or, you know, in a living room, depending on the situation. And then outside of that, we could get some time together doing, doing something relationally building into one another, uh, living life together. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, now, what I probably wouldn't do is take the time that I was going to spend in the counseling relationship and go do that some, to go do something somewhere else. But uh, I, have, I have taken a counselee uh, who's come, and uh, oftentimes I'll meet people at my house and uh, maybe I've met with two other couples or something. This is the third session of the day. And I'll say, you know what? I just need to go for a walk. Let's just go for a walk and let's start talking. And we'll, you know, we'll just start our counseling session on the road. And yeah, I, th I think that's completely appropriate. But it's, it's got that priority of having that, that uh, spiritual conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, you're meeting with a guy, and I don't know what you guys would do. Like, I haven't really heard, like, what you guys do for free time, for uh, activities and stuff. If I, if I was meeting with a guy, and he was telling me about some experiences like that, uh, <laughs> I'd be like, hey, I'll come watch you, <laughs> you know? Um, or, like, for uh, in, in the U.S., maybe a guy tells me, you know, every once in a while he tries to get out on a golf course. You know what? I'll, I'll come swing with you sometime. Can we go play nine holes together and, and just golf? I think or uh, an activity like that gives you a lot of time to walk and talk, and um, uh, so maybe riding bulls could work. Um, maybe a guy's a pool player. You know, hey, let's go let's go shoot some pool, and uh, I'd love to just you know uh, see you or be with you in that environment. And by the way, we'll, we'll just continue to talk. Uh, I'll bring out different things. I'm not going to try to maybe open up scriptures in that moment, but um, in, in finding out how things are going, we can expand the conversation so that I'm listening for things that then I can take back into the counseling room. Hey, I heard you mention this during our, uh, during our time together. I hadn't really heard you say that before. Can you tell me more about that? You know, and just, it just broadens the, the spectrum of conversation yeah, and so knowing a person. Yeah, familiar, familiarity is a double-edged sword. So, at time, and in part, it's really helpful it, to have that, um, and we'll talk about it here in just a second, but um, to have that um, uh, involvement already. We, one of the things we'll talk about is building involvement with the counselee. And if you've, if you've already got a level of, of um, relationship, familiarity with one another, it's going to be a natural bridge into the counseling process. But it's also possible that they minimize the value of meeting with you because, well, it's just you. And so maybe I'll take seriously what you say, maybe I won't. I have found that when people are, when people are, are needing counsel, um, if I show a level of sincerity that I'm there to serve them and care for them, they're ready to go. They need help. They recognize they need help. And so a good counselee is going to have that, that learner spirit. They're going to be, they're going to be ready to, to work through this with me. I don't need to go hang out with them to get that, right? Culturally, you may say, that wouldn't work here. We do need to get time outside of the counseling room. And so in that case, then so be it.